the Woolly Ramblings podcast. My name is Nicole, and I'm coming to you today from the central Willamette Valley in Western Oregon, where I live with my husband and my one-year-old son. This is a video podcast focused on my knitting and spinning crafting, though I also share about my life as a shepherd, the life cycle of the farm, and all about the woolly sheep that make up my life. <laughs> so welcome, thank you for joining me, um, and I hope you all have been having a wonderful two weeks since I last podcast. It is October. Is it just me or did September fly by really fast? But we're here now and we are enjoying all the lovely fall weather. Um, it's a cloudy overcast day, so I'm hoping the lighting will be okay today and lots of rain. But we're also having those beautiful fall days where the clouds burn off and it's nice and warm and all the fall colors just shine. So um, I hope wherever you are that you are having a lovely fall or spring if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, but yeah, welcome. So I don't have much to share with you as usual because I have been very monogamous on my sweater that I've been sharing with you the last couple episodes. Now this all might change because I've been kind of feeling that I need something else. I need something to swap out. Um, maybe something that's a little bit more mindless, maybe something that's um, using the rustic yarns that I prefer. Um, I don't typically use uh, the superwash um, yarn like I am in this project, especially for this large of a project. Normally I just have a skein of superwash that I couldn't resist, and so I knit it up into a pair of socks. But um, this time, I just, like I've said in the previous episodes about this yarn, I fell in love with this yarn. This yarn spoke to me and said that it was a Zwag sweater, so I had to make the Zwag sweater out of it, and I'm really loving the results. The results are great. Um, I've actually made quite a bit of progress, so I guess I should show that to you now, since we're kind of just shifted right into knitting. So this is my swag sweater. I have made a lot of progress since I have last spoke to you. So I have finished the yoke of the sweater, have separated for the sleeves, and have now started the body. My husband's been teasing me that I have been knitting this way faster than his sweater, which I don't think is completely true. It might be a little bit true um, because when you have this nice fun color work and lace detail up on top, you kind of, it, you just want to knit another row. You want to knit another row. And when you're just knitting a stockinette sweater, well, that's fun and all. You don't maybe push yourself as hard. So either way, whatever you might say, I, this is a smaller size than his sweater. And I'm using fingering weight instead of the sport weight that I was using for his sweater. So take that as you will. But I have made a really good amount of progress. So last time I think I was about to here on the lace pattern. And now I have completed that. And you can, I put it um, on a, I've slightly extended my cable on my needle so that I could show you a little bit better today. I unfortunately have not been able to try it on. Um, I really wanted to try it on before this episode so I could talk to you about the fit a little bit because I am a little bit concerned about how this is going to fit me. So in the pattern, um, after you complete the uh, yoke shaping here, so the lace and then the little color work here on the bottom, the pattern tells you to continue knitting with the main body color um, until your yoke has reached a depth of nine inches. Well, I knit a couple rows of the main color and all of a sudden realized, you know, this looks way longer than nine inches. So I measured mine and it was way longer than nine inches. It was in fact 11 inches. So I'm a little bit worried how that's going to affect the fit of this sweater. So I really want to try it on and see where it sits on my body. I don't know if this is going to mean I'm going to want to knit the body portion down here shorter than what it's suggesting, um, or if I'm 
if I'm just going to have a more oversized sweater than what I thought it was going to be. I know this sweater already is kind of an oversized type of sweater, so, and I've never knit a yoke sweater before. I've only ever done the, um, I haven't even done a real raglan. It's been more of just a typical sweater that, um, you separate for the sleeves and then you knit the sleeves off of it. Um, so I'm not really sure what to expect and I don't know anything about how I could fix this. And at this point, I don't know if I really want to change it up. Um, oh, and I meant to bring up the color, the, um, this, uh, contrasting color to show you how close of yarn chicken I was playing. I knew I was going to be playing a little bit of yarn chicken um, when I started this because the um, Teal Torch Knits um, DK weight, which is what I'm knitting in, um, so I'm uh, the colorways I'm using um, is High Queen Margot, which is the main body color, and then the light white color that speckled with the blues, yellows, and a little bit of purple um, is Dangerously Happy. Anyways, I had only gotten one skein of Dangerously Happy, and I knew I was going to be pushing it a little bit because the yarn is only 246 yards per skein. You'll see that. Okay, I'll just tell you. And I believe this Wag sweater says, um, for my size, that I need around 300 yards for this uh, colorway. And I didn't have that, so I knew I was going to be playing yarn chicken a little bit. And I finished with just this little itty bitty a few yards left. Um, I had planned that if I saw that I was running short that I was going to shorten these um, vertical bars and not do that as long, but it all worked out and yarn chicken paid off. Um, so now I am on the main body, like you see. The main body has these um, X crosses. Um, I don't know how well you can see because the light's really bright. So this is part has slowed me down. I'm starting to slow down at this point because I have to pay attention. I'm not just knitting stockinette, so I have to pay attention, see how many rows I've done, make sure that I haven't gone past the uh, cable X um, pattern row, and so I'm having to pay a lot more attention. So that's where I'm at my Zweig sweater. Um, oh, and the reason I haven't tried it on is because my cable is not long enough and my longer cable for me to extend this cable. So these are my Chiaogu um, interchangeable sets. So I added a cable on to be able to show this to you a little bit better. But the cable that I need is actually holding my other sweater, my nurtured sweater. So like I kind of mentioned in the beginning, I'm starting to feel like because the main body here is a little bit slower, it's a little more sluggish, that I need something um, something more mundane, something smaller, something rustic yarn, maybe heavier yarn, I don't know yet. So the most logical point would be for me to go back to my nurture sweater and work on that somewhere. Um, or I could pick up a smaller project, maybe a pair of socks. Um, I'm trying to use stuff out of my stash right now and not to go out and purchase yarn, which I'm not super big on purchasing yarn, um, just spontaneously, so I would need to stash dive a little bit and see, um, which I will need to go unload some boxes to see what I have and what I would want in it, so I'm not really sure where I'm going to be at on that. Um, so with that said, that is it for my knitting content, and I haven't been spinning, so <laughs> that's pretty much it. But I did promise you in the last episode that we'd have some sheepy talk this episode. And we are going to do that. I'm going to do a brief intro here, and then you're going to go to the farm with me, and I'm going to show you around um, as we prep for lambing. So it's in the last episode I mentioned that we're getting ready for lambing, and I know that starts some thoughts going, wait, we were talking about breeding season not that long ago, just a few episodes ago. 
how are we already on lambing? So our horned dorset flock, which um, our Romney flock was in breeding, we just pulled the rams out yesterday. So we are completed with breeding season. So now the dorset flock is going to be starting lambing, or at least part of our dorset flock. About half of our dorset, horned dorset flock is going to be lambing. And that is one of the more unique and beautiful traits of the horned dorset breed is that they are one of the very few breeds that are not seasonally tied. So they can breed and lamb at any point during the year. Yeah. Versus the Romneys, who are very tied to the seasons, and many breeds are also this way, where the lambs um, are always born in spring because the fertile cycle of these breeds does not start until the weather cools, the days become shorter, so the dorsets aren't that way. So we bred these guys, um, this group of about seven ewes, in the spring to have fall lambs. So we are expecting our first ewe is due starting Tuesday, which is actually tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so it's really exciting. There'll be lots of cute lambs to share with you here in the future. So right now we are prepping for these lambs to arrive. So we are getting our um, maternity ward set up, getting all the supplies we need, and I'm going to take you to the farm now and kind of talk a little bit more about that and show you what's going on. Um, and yeah, so I hope you will enjoy that. I will see you in two weeks. And um, happy knitting, happy spinning, happy crafting, and I will see you next time. Hi guys, so welcome to the farm. As I promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the preparations that we are doing to prepare for fall lambing. So I'm starting out here in what is going to be our maternity ward for our fall lambing. This area is not normally our maternity ward. Um, but as I've kind of talked about in some of the episodes of the podcast, we are on a more personal level. My husband and I are looking to buy a house. My mom is in the beginnings of building a new house on the farm here. So unfortunately, due to some situations here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's been really hard to find storage units. So our barn which is next door here, um, is norm normally where we would have our maternity ward set up and that this lean-to whole barn area of the barn would not be used until the third stage of our lamb's development and adjusting to um, sheepy social <laughs> life. Luckily, we only have seven horned dorset ewes lambing this uh, fall, so this area should be plenty big enough with the extended um, dry pen next to us uh, to house them for this fall. Um, so my husband has been putting in a lot of work cleaning over here. So this side of the pole barn has not been cleaned in quite a few years. <laughs> And in some of the clips I'm going to uh, put over this, you're going to see that just how deep uh, the manure is that he's cleaning. We just got our own tractor last fall, and my husband has had the opportunity to use it a couple times in cleaning the inside of the barn, but we haven't ever had the opportunity when this side of the barn was clear um, of sheep and um, open to be able to... Um, clean over here with the tractor. Our tractor is very small. It's not a small, a large tractor at all. So it looks really lost among this deep layers of manure. And it gets really built up, especially in the spot where my husband is cleaning currently and what you'll see in the clips I took of him cleaning. Um, this is where our feeder, our hay feeder is. And so a lot of times there's more uh, hay buildup in this spot um, from the ewes and lambs wasting hay and spreading hay on the floor. So that's part of the reason it's so deep in this spot. Um, so yeah, we are working really hard to try to clean this side out 
in preps for lambing. Unfortunately, my husband and I are going on a early anniversary trip, and so this side is not probably going to get cleaned in time um, for the first lammers. But we hope to get this all cleaned out this fall, at least the, at least half of this, um, in order to get it all fresh and ready for lambing. Um, our big hope is that the barn will, we will have secured ourselves a house and have all our stuff moved out of the barn in time for the Romney lambing that will occur in January and February. So, so that's um, this project. I'm going to share with you some of the most basic lambing supplies items that we keep on hand during lambing season. So I hope that'll be interesting for you, and that'll be next. Let's talk lambing supplies. There is a lot of lambing supplies needed during lambing season and that is kept on the farm. And because I don't know how interesting this video is going to be to all of you, I'm going to keep it pretty short and sweet, hopefully. It might be longer than what I planned, but I'm going to show you some of the most basic items that we use um, during the initial first 24 hours. This by no means covers every single item that we have um, in our lambing uh, stock, but I thought this might give you a little bit of an idea of some of the things that goes into lambing and tools that we need. Let's say you just had a successful and easy birth. What are some of the things that we need for her and her lambs when they first come into their bonding pen, which we call a jug? So there's a little catchy rhyme that we use and I learned as a youth um, to help you remember some of those first initial steps. And that phrase is snip, dip, strip and sip. So first off we have snip. A pair of scissors. A really basic tool to have around the farm and we use these scissors to trim the umbilical cord of lambs. Now some farms don't opt to do this and they claim that they feel it introduces infection by snipping it and just leave the natural tearing. We trim it because sometimes you have lambs that have very long umbilical cords. And one thing you can have um, a problem with is use who are our aggressive cleaners. And sometimes when you have use who are such aggressive cleaners, they will uh, actually bite off the umbilical cord to the point that it's non-existent. And you don't want that to happen because then you risk bleeding. Um, so, we snip. That's the first step. We like to leave about an inch or two um, umbilical cord length. And then we dip. So, we use a iodine solution. Um, you can't buy a strong iodine anymore as you used to be, but this is a disinfectant antiseptic. And we treat instantly dip the umbilical cord in iodine so that it helps speed up the drying process of the umbilical cord. Um, this helps reduce the risk of bacteria introduction that can cause the lambs to get very sick. Um, something called joint ill can be a problem um, that sometimes bacteria can get in through the navel. So snip, dip, strip, which I don't have a tool to show you, just my hands, and that essentially step. That step just means that we go in and get milk from the ewe's udder. Um, make sure her teats are open. Ewe's will get a waxy plug at the opening of their teat and sometimes lambs cannot get that waxy plug out by themselves. So we like to make sure those teats are open, colostrum, colostrum is flowing, so that lambs will be able to easily go up to the ewe and nurse. A lot of times lambs are able to do this on their own, but we go ahead and make sure that those uh, teat passageways are open. If by chance the lamb is weak or needs some assistance, we have feeding tubes. So we have two types, a more traditional stomach tube that 
amazing catheter setup, catheter uh, syringe setup, and this really nifty little tool that uses gravity to bring milk to the lamb's stomach. So it's also a stomach tube right here. So this is for really weak lambs, those lambs that can't suckle on a bottle themselves or on their mom. Um, I didn't bring a bottle in to show you what a bottle looks like, but we do also have um, bottles and special bottle nipples that are especially for lambs and also goats that we use. So anyways, these are more of a emergency type situation tool, but I thought I would show these to you. So those are the initial first steps when the lamb comes in. Another step that we actually do when lambs are first brought into the jug is we weigh them. And this is a little scale, it's a digital scale, and you can see it has a hook on the bottom, and we have a nifty little sling where the lamb's legs go through, and we are able to get a suspended weight on them. And this is for our records purposes. This can be used for if the lamb gets sick and we need to give it medication. This also is just for our records to see how is this you doing, how are her lambs doing, and where they're at. So this is a good starting point um, to get us a starting weight for our lambs. Another item that we use right after um, a lamb is born in the first 24 hours is some product called Nutrigen, and we have a second one, which I don't have a bottle for, called Baby Lamb Stream. This is essentially a nutrition supplement that is rich in all sorts of vitamins. The um, Baby Lamb Strength has vitamins that are not covered in the Nutridrench, and this gives all our lambs a boost. It's kind of like having a super vitamin. <laughs> So sometimes lambs are feeling poorly, uh, maybe they got pushed out, maybe it's been raining. Um, this is a really great product. We automatically give this to every lamb that goes through our um, jugs. This also can be used for ewes. Occasionally we have ewes who need a little bit of a boost or need some extra vitamins. This is also used for them as well. So those are the things that we do in that first 24 hours for our lambs when they are first brought into the jugs. Those are used on every lamb, minus the tubes, uh, minus the feeding tubes. Those are used on every single lamb that comes into the pen. Some other things that we also have on hand for our lambs during this time is extra colostrum, whether it be powdered or saved from other use. Lamb milk replacer, which is a powdered formula, especially for lambs, that is used to supplement milk if a ewe doesn't have enough milk or a lamb needs to be pulled off for some reason. We also keep livestock grade molasses. This is a special treat for our ewes once they lamb. Sometimes ewes can have had a rough birth or they're just feeling a little down and mopey post birth. And so we add a little bit of molasses and some warm water for them and as a little treat to give them boost and some more energies, we use the molasses for that. So that gives you a little bit of an insight into some of our very basic lambing supplies. Like I said, there's much, much, much more that we keep on stock during lambing for various cases and scenarios that can come up. I hope this was interesting to you, and if you have any questions, be sure to comment below, and I'd be happy to try to answer your questions either in the comments or in a future video.